I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple, science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. With the new RP Diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be, and if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Folks, welcome back to the weekly webinar, Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Isratel, as always. So uh, I don't know if any of you guys noticed, I'm sure you did, RP Plus had a little bit of a change of formatting, so it looks a little bit different when you log in. And uh, some of you already mentioned that you had some trouble finding the, uh, the place to post the questions because it's not where it normally is. So I had our web person and Mike's sister, Sonia, actually look into it. So hopefully by next week, where you post your questions is a little easier to find this time. So I think it was just buried at the end of the thread. <laughs> everything, everything that was pinned went to the, the last thread, but we found it for now and hopefully next time we'll be good to go. Yeah. You tell them James. Yeah. Well, I, I was a match. So I had a, a, a meme in my head, you know, the, the, um, the angry lady and the like wincing cat. Yeah. Uh, Right, so it was like the angry, <laughs> the angry, the angry lady was like, "RP Plus looks different," and then like the wincing cat was like, "Weekly webinar." <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully it'll be easy for you guys next time. Uh, you want to get started? We have got a relatively short list tonight. Let's do it. All right, so a man only named John. John. Okay, quick rant before I go on. I know, I know that John Wick is cool. I love John Wick. I love the movies. I like the overly stylized shit that they do, you know, because the, I mean, it's, it's very stylized videography and script. But one thing that, because for no reason at all annoys me, I mean, there's no explaining this. There's an explaining, but no justifying, is how they say each other's names a lot as a form of greeting, either goodbye or hello. Like, you know what I'm saying? Jews say yes. shalom, and it means goodbye, hello, and I think peace. He'll be like, John. And the other guy would be like, Frank. And it's just like, you don't say a motherfucking name that many times in a day. I don't even know if I say James that often. I say, hey, yo, or goodbye. You know what I'm saying? I, like, if I'm leaving, I'm like, peace. I'm not like, James like what the fuck is that that shit is fucking weird bro oh my god I used to uh my my ex Dion um her and her family both they all did that they would always like every time they spoke they would address each other by their name and I always like thought that was funny and I used to give her shit about that all the time you know who you're talking to for the love of god yeah (laughs) John John says nutrition question if you guys wouldn't would mind giving your thoughts or wouldn't should we worry about limiting red meat intake if we're already focusing on eating 90% plus lean red meats, meaning lean content of the meat is not 90% of my diet. It is the lean meats, right? Um, got you covered there for a carnivore. I think that you can eat 90% lean red meat, and if the rest of your diet is fundamentally healthy, you are fucking golden. Um, not a problem at all. Uh, can you optimize your diet a little bit more? Um to get extra super longevity by eating a bit considerably more fish, uh, probably, but you're looking at uh, something that I'll tell you what is between like one to three years of life extension at the end of your life slash. We don't know if it's any life extension because every time we think we have a grasp on the state of the literature and these real peripheral, tiny effects on health, a new comprehensive review comes out and goes, yeah, meat's actually not that bad at all. So one thing they have trouble with meat research is people that eat meat are generally pieces of shit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, but seriously, there's a lot of pieces of shit that eat meat and far fewer pieces of shit that eat vegan. Like if you're vegan, you're probably a good person, probably too good, and it pisses everybody off. You would probably take care of your health and all that other bullshit. The average red meat eater is a person who sits around and also smokes cigarettes through his steaks. You know, so um, they have a real hard time taking that apart. And in the most uh, recent reviews literature, they've done much more advanced statistical treatment of the data um, that had much more comprehensive data sets and have been able to uh, get uh, a lot of the variables out of the way. And the more they get out of the way, the 
now they can't even conclude that red meat consumption does much of anything as far as your health is concerned and, and the negative. So, you know, that's, uh, I'll put to you this way, an interesting uh, tidbit for science, theory of science. If further, better, more precise studies lead to the reduction in the size of the effect of your variable of interest, you're probably looking at a variable that makes either no difference at all or just doesn't do anything. If incrementally more precise studies increase the variable of magnitude, then you're probably looking at a real phenomenon. One was the um, effect of the common home, and this is a famous example, the effect of the common home environment, like how your parents talk to you, you're a good boy, you're a bad boy, on personality traits, deep personality traits later in life. And uh, as the studies got better and better controlled, you saw that the common home environment went from roughly 10% estimated effect on personality to roughly zero. If you are a betting person, just don't bet that that is a big deal because if you, better studies give you results that are, it looks like it's less of it. It's probably just doesn't do anything or is very small. So same idea with red meat, the gross studies, like if you just correlate red meat consumption to gross health outcomes, Jesus Christ, it looks like a goddamn cancer causing fucking heart disease. I mean, everything, suicide probably. Uh, and then as you pull out more and more variables, leaving red meat in, so if you look at a group of people that consume red meat often but have excellent health behaviors otherwise and consume, uh, compare them to people that eat a lot of fish and otherwise have the same health behaviors, you basically don't see anything, which just tells us that you know red meat probably is not uh, any way bad for your health and probably worth your time. Unless you're super into longevity, you probably just wouldn't be on RP+. Plus. <laughs> Yeah. I looked into this a little bit because I have like a strong family history of various types of cancers and I was kind of a little concerned about the red meat issue. And most of it, it seems to be uh, confounded by genetics and other lifestyle factors, like just like Mike said, being a piece of shit, but really like being overweight, being, you know, unfit, uh, yep. being just inactive and eating more than you need to. And that's the funny thing with most of these health things where you look at like cholesterol, you look at all these like, you know, trans fats and stuff. And like, sometimes there's something there, but a lot of the times it's just like, don't be a fat Java for your most of your life and you're probably fine. Um, that seems to be the case here. So I think it's maybe in your interest to not exclusively eat red meat in some ways. Uh, that might not be the best thing in the world, but at the same time, it's probably not the worst thing either. So yeah, it's kind of one of those like, eh, shrug, do your best. Yeah, and if it's lean red meat, you're getting away from a lot of the other confounding variables, which is a high amount of animal saturated fat is not always good for you. Like it is if it's in dairy for product form, the, you know, with eggs, it's probably, it's not, it's not clear yet, but with um, very fatty meats, yeah, it might not be the greatest thing for you. So if it's lean, then you're probably good to go. Totes. Uh, Basim Imadi says, good evening, Mike and James. How was the RP Summit? Did it go well? It seemed to be very fun, and I hope uh, the best for RP in the future. And James, your hair has grown so quickly already. I'm so proud sheds tear. It was actually really good. A wild man. Apologies for being an ass with the questions last week. I'm hoping to make up for it by not being that much of a cunt again. Well, you know, you pay good money to be a cunt, so cunt away. You fucking cunt. Fucking cunt. Yeah, man. Uh, number one, you said that I was too advanced in my thinking to be writing physique templates. I bought them specifically so that I don't have to overthink my training, but now uh, I know too You're much. you fucked up. Oh, the agony. I'm thinking of ways I can modify the template for my needs, one of them being increasing the frequency for muscle groups like side and rear dolls, traps, and perhaps biceps, as they seem to recover rather quickly for me. I, I could also switch, I could also perhaps switch over some stuff. I have to be wary that adding more exercises could perhaps affect my total body MRV. That's true. Mm -hmm. Giving less room for other muscle groups. However, I feel like I'm not advanced enough to have to worry about full body MRV. Exceeding mm -hmm. individual muscle groups, um, or rather not exceeding individual muscle groups, the other way around. What weaknesses do you think the templates have that I could modify? I can only think of the frequency, but that's it really. So one the extra thing you can program in there is different rep ranges within the mesocycle. You could easily do that. That's the easiest thing in the world. Just lie about how strong you are. Um, and uh, different frequencies is a really good start. Uh, more advanced out of regulation, really, because it says like, hey, how sore do you feel slash how recovered were you? But really, those should be two different indices. I don't want to know if you want to make that sort of auto-regulation system yourself, but you can give some thought to that. James, do you got anything? I mean, yeah, the, it's not so much that the template has weaknesses so much that it just, um, it's just not individualized and that's, that would be considered a weakness. So the frequencies is a big one. The individual um, volumes per muscle group or per movement uh, activity uh, would, that would be something you should modify heavily. Like, even the SFR of some exercises, you might find some exercises are really good. And some of the ones on the list maybe aren't uh, that great for you. That's fine. Um, 
I have a hard time imagining if you just are modifying things like biceps, rear delts, traps, that you're really going to like throw your <laughs> systemic MRV for a big loop. I mean, it, it's feasible, but those are such small, low fatigue muscle groups. The only thing I could imagine getting you is if you're doing like a lot of like barbell shrugs, like four times per week, just standing and holding that weight there might kind of creep up on you. But other than that, I think you'll probably be fine. Just yeah. use the, use the, the template as, as, as a template and then just, just modify it as, as your own individual needs. Like if you can train biceps four or five times per week, then do it and, you know, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, then he says, I think when I finally finish the recovery book, my landmarks book and scientific principles of strength training, I'll finally be able to use set principles to program for myself in a legit manner. And the same way I use the nutritional principles to create my own diet. Mm -hmm. Also, when we come out with the body part guides, I think you're going to really like those. Um, that should be coming out very soon. Can't wait for the hypertrophy book to come out. So become all powerful and become self-sufficient. Align all my chakras and principles together to create a super sane version of me. Mm. Mm. I agree. That would be incredible. Number two, I have a client who wants to learn to be able to do a full pull-up. To be able to do a pull-up in a few weeks. Okay. So the first of all, I'm just going to... James knows exactly what I'm going to say. I was, I was like, there's two, route, there's two routes we're going to go here. I wonder which yeah. one he's going to pick. Yeah. So uh, to channel the spirit of Thomas Sowell, it is by no means clear this person is going to be able to do a pull-up in a few weeks. <laughs> right? We don't know that that's possible. So let's keep reading. But remember, not all desires are realistic. It's also not necessarily a matter of learning either. Yeah. Right. So let's, let's keep going. I remember Mike mentioning that specificity can only get you so far with pull-ups. Well, in a few weeks, that's the only thing you have because you won't be able to face potentiate shit in a few weeks, especially if you can't even do a single one. An example you brought up was of how somebody won't increase their squat rep max by doing single rep at a time. You also mentioned, I mean, you could, it'd just be a shitty way to do it. Uh, you also mentioned that a period without any pull-ups at all, but instead hypertrophy focus block to actually increase back musculature would be more beneficial to insert my engine analogy here, <laughs> rewire and retrain the new musculature for strength, giving more pull-ups. This is not quite possible as the client only has three weeks, I believe, until their deadline or whatever. Jesus what kind of Christ. weird Mad Max Fuck. Pull up deadline is this? Fuck. Fuck. You're going to die. Pull up. Oh, my God. Would it be correct for me to program lap pull downs or negative pull ups for her in the five to 10 rep range as soon as she can get uh, a weight above six reps or do negatives for more than six reps? I increase the weight on the pull downs uh, and make the negative pull ups even more overloading with perhaps a few pauses. Would it be correct for me to program lap pull downs or negative pull ups for in the five to 10 range? No, that is not correct. But very good thinking, Basim. I think my recommendation would be to program pull ups in the one to five range pull downs and negative pull ups and assisted pull ups. Um, and because that's going to maximize peak strength, which in a few weeks is what you're training her for. Um, James? Yeah, I'm just trying to think like, obviously, like we've, we've given a similar answer for hypertrophy kind of focused for strength, like, man, I think assisted pull up and, and pull, like assisted pull up variations are going to be your way to go. Yeah, I, normally, I would say I'm not a huge fan of the negatives uh, from like a, a longevity of your training block perspective. Yeah. But in this case, I think it actually might not be a terrible idea. I wouldn't do the pull downs. The pull, you just don't have enough time to really benefit from them. Yeah, the specificity transfer shit. So assisted yeah. pull ups uh, plus negative pull ups. Like, uh, here's one. Like, forget negative pull ups. Like, if she has someone to help her, which she should, and if, you know, she could probably just get someone at the gym to do this. Have someone launch her up, like help her on the way up, and then she goes down on her own. But the help on the way up should be really minimal, so that she's basically doing four reps, like of her 5RM, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, and then, you know, slowly and but surely the help decreases and hopefully she can do a pull up. You want a, a peak there, a taper, you probably know how to build a basic one of those. Um, I would also recommend pretty high frequency training in her case. So I would say she needs to do um, these pull ups, negative pull ups, assisted pull ups, uh, three to four times a week with, you know, two to two to six sets of them per session. Um, because that maximizes neural learning and short-term strength increases and probably in her case, hypertrophy too. Um, you're not going to be launching her pull up much on hypertrophy because you don't grow much muscle in three weeks. It's going to have to be mostly neural and that needs lots of practice with heavy weights. That's it. And you can also just do negative sets where if you have like a step up box or something, she can just step up, like jump up, do a negative set, like come down, step up, jump up, repeat. Like if she's really 
nowhere even remotely close. But if she's nowhere remotely close, she's not going to Yeah, it's like, this is one of those like funny conundrums. Like, why is there a deadline here on this, in this? But yeah, at that point. Hey, Bassin, later when you reply uh, next week, why don't you let us know why the fuck this is happening? Just out of curiosity, as much as you can say anyway. I'm, I'm guessing she's probably doing like some kind of fitness challenge. Military or, or oh, okay. that. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's just comedy, man. Like, this is strong. Like, because nobody would be, unless you're, you're, I have a hard time imagining somebody is trying to get into the military or as like a first responder and they're not able to even remotely come close to some of these fitness markers. Oh, you know I mean? I've met people like that, JMO. I mean, realistically, I mean, I mean like, yeah, there are people who have, they, sh- they should have just quit while they were ahead, but most people who take it seriously, if they know that there's push-ups or pull-ups, they're going to like, you know, they will have at least experimented more than three weeks out from the test itself. If they're reasonable. This shit is fucking crazy to me, man. Mm-hmm. Anyway, hope that advice was decent. Number three, Mike, if I was, if I want to get, if I was to want to get into contact with you privately, how would I do that? Facebook? Well, you said to send me dick pics. Um, but on, on a serious note, uh, Bassam, I follow you on Instagram, so hit me up on the, on the gram. Just message me, and I'll get your message. Um, for the rest of you folks listening, if I don't follow you, I never get your messages, so meh, don't message me with an expectation of reply. Just comment on my posts. <laughs> um, says that's all I had for today, and he says, Ho, hello, holy moly, you guys really did something with RP Plus website. I'm loving the new design, but this forum, by the way, is impossible to find. I was lucky I survived. Yeah, most people didn't. So a few, very few form questions uh, to this time. But we're going to get more info on how to find the form. Um, he said, here's the deal. Since I posted my last discussion on bad timing, leading them not being answered, I'll just pile these on. If it's all right with you guys, it's totally okay. Number four, so if I want to modify resensitization meso in the physique template to make it more strength focused, I'm thinking of doing this as a correct. Increase the mouse cycle to four to one or more. Yeah, I wouldn't straight trade for more than a four to one, so Three to one or four to one is fine. Make the rep range of my exercise about three to six reps, making the weights uh, of the first cut about 75% of my 1RM, while also having the majority of overload being done by intensity progression. Yes, as to for the intensity progression, as to the three to six reps, the rep range is correct. Uh, the 75% of my 1RM is like a guess, right? So you just don't know how many reps, because it like, depends on the exercise, depends on the individual, so many other factors. Depends on the kind of uh, fiber type you're in, you know, like, for people that are more slow twitch dominant, even at the time, because fiber types shift, 75% of the 1RM, they could do like 10 times or 15 times, while other people, very fast twitch, that 75% of 1RM is going to be much higher, but they might be able to do it for you know just five reps or something. So I would say just using your warm-ups and a, a couple of feel sets, target a weight that's three to six reps with you know two IR. Um, and also I would just say with the reps in reserve, I don't know what it is like on the current templates, but I wouldn't train any less than two, any more than two reps in reserve on strength. So I wouldn't do three or four reps in reserve because that's way too many. James? Um, yeah, I had a couple of things. So I don't remember what, because we've done so many templates at this point, I don't remember how it was set up, but generally when you're going from hypertrophy to strength, more often than not, you're not going to increase the mesocycle length. Now, I remember there was a couple short ones. There were some that were like two and one or three. And yeah, one. Two, there's a two to one there. So, right, so three to one, four to one is fine. But. Three to one, four to one is fine. But just as a general trend, like you wouldn't increase the length for strength. Typically, it's going to go the other direction. So I just, just food for thought there. And with the reps, it really depends on where you left off in your last meso. So if you had left off doing a metabolite like combination meso where you were like 10 to 20. Have. Yeah, 10 to 20 and then maybe 20 to 30. I would actually go against that and five say to ten. five to 10. Exactly. And then if you were to do another repeat of uh, that, you could do the three to six or like four. I'll, I'll use four to eight just as an example, but yeah, that's the same idea, but you want to have, you, you'd want to have a heavy ish one in between there going from sets of like 25 to sets of three is a disaster waiting yeah. to happen. I promise. Yeah. You. I've done it a lot. It sucks. Um, just another food for thought while James is on the subject. Um, James and I are real big proponents of if you're going to do a strength meso, do two or three of them shits because yes. just one strength meso gets you basically like, it's like shifting your gears in your car finally. And then you're like, and like race is over. You're like, okay. Uh, you know, gear shift that takes a meso and you say, oh, it's a wasted meso. No, it shifts your gears. It accomplishes, it puts you in this unbelievable groove to really get a lot out of strength training. Uh, and of course, it does make you stronger, but just a little, you could get, the thing is, like, if you continued for another meso, oh my God, dude, you would hit fucking radical PRs. But if you just did it one meso, like, you know, you'd be a little stronger than normal, and then you go back to hypertrophy. So uh, 
if you don't, if you're going to bother with the strength stuff and you're going to cost your joints a little bit, so on and so forth, do two or three mesos, at least two. If you're not, just stick to the fucking normal resensitization because you're really just changing gears and costing your joints some psychology, some, some, some fatigue uh, for probably pretty close to nothing. James, am I off base on that? Or? No, I think a lot of people like, like to switch to strength because they, um, I think it's like an easier Feel mental swag switch. A little more. Yeah, it's like easier to say like I'm training for something rather than kind of training for essentially nothing or at least uh, it's training for a, a longer term investment. So for a lot of people, it's easier to flip that switch, but then they kind of will sell themselves short. And like, um, I remember we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago and somebody was like, oh yeah, I do like 80% of the sets on my strength that I would do for hypertrophy. And you, you see a lot of people do that where they're like, oh, I used to do 10 sets of squats. Now I'm doing eight by five. It's like, yeah. No. What are you doing, bro? Yeah. Like you're going to, A, it's going to be a lot of wear and tear and B, like if, you're, if your long-term goal is to be a more jacked guy, then you're actually, it's really defeating the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. So I'm, I'm all for strength training. Like Mike and I come from a strength background or strength sports, strength power sports. So we're never going to thumbs down strength, but just keep in mind, like why are you training for strength when you could be training for resensitization, which although is more boring and less sexy, it does have a more profound effect for long-term. So let me, let me tell you guys another little clue in on the design of the templates and something that James and I, I actually just ran through the editing James did on this in the face potentiation chapter of the uh, book. As you can tell, we're getting close to the end of the book, which is really good. Um, when I wrote this part originally, uh, it struck me as, is when you write a book, you discover a lot of stuff. You actually learn a lot of stuff writing a book because when you have to really put your thoughts down concretely, you're like, well, that hasn't made any goddamn sense. You're like, oh my God, this implies like three other things. So one thing that James and I sort of figured out is like the active rest phase does a lot of what the resensitization phase does, except faster because it's only two weeks long <laughs> as opposed to taking a whole month of lower volumes. And then so we sort of have to justify resensitization phases, which is one of the reasons why in the, the physique templates, you'll notice the resensitization phase is only two or three weeks long. It's really kind of an active rest phase because that one's a, one of those weeks is a deal. So we end up having to say, why is resensitization? When is resensitization better than active rest? And the answer is in beginners and intermediates who still need to develop technical proficiency in the lift. And to be honest, and this is not something we mentioned in the book, but you guys get a little bonus content here at RP+. Plus. Um, to be honest, it's because they get to keep the culture of lifting and not get bored and fly off the fucking, because a lot of times you tell beginners, hey, listen, you train super hard last four months, you're the man, now two weeks, come almost basically off. They're like, fuck that. And they're just going to do dumb hypertrophy shit anyway. You might as well be like, okay, here's the next month that we're going to go heavy, but lower volumes to cool everything off. And at least the heavy is fun, right? It keeps them in the culture of lifting. And for the actual benefit, it lets them uh, perhaps get a little stronger. Perhaps, James, I reworded that for your request. Oh, thank uh, which you. Which is thank completely you. correct. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> uh, and, and also, just to keep working on the technical patterns, improve their technique in those lifts, improve their stimulus to fatigue ratios for future lifting. Because they still don't really know what the fuck they're doing. I mean, especially in a maintenance phase, you can improve your squat technique so much because, look, the pressure's off. You don't have to get a hypertrophic stimulus. You go in there, you pick a pretty lightweight or moderate weight, and you do it for very few sets and reps. You can really focus on technique because fundamentally, you know, it's a maintenance phase and really there's no muscle to gain. There's no fat to lose. There's not risk of anything. So it's a really good time to improve technique and, and keep solidifying that culture of training. But to be completely honest, for advanced individuals, and we do mention this in the book, if you've been training more than more than 10 years for sure, more than five years for many people, resensitization phases can probably be replaced by active rest phases in most cases. Um, and then after only two weeks, you get almost full resensitization because you've barely been doing shit and all your injuries heal because you've barely been doing shit, which means that like, you know, you train hard for six months and you take two weeks, like almost off, like one week of barely anything and one week almost completely off. And that is actually a really good way to train. You do get the resensitization effect, but in a shorter time, the, which is again, why James and I, when people say like, can I do a longer maintenance phase than four weeks? Like there has to be a need for that sort of thing. Um, it's four weeks is already plenty long to do everything. If you do want to make it longer then maybe you can make it a strength phase, but then you need to make it nice and long, eight weeks, 12 weeks to get a lot of strength adaptations going. 
So I totally agree with all those points. And like just one other thing to consider is that we usually are under the assumption that the person is doing the training and concurrently doing some type of dieting. And so one of the problems that you run into is two weeks of active rest is, is plenty enough to get the resensitization effect that you want, but it might not be enough time to actually get the metabolic effects of the diet end that you want, right? So a lot of the times we'll say, just run it for longer, do a resensitization period because maybe they had been doing a diet and they need some time to kind of stabilize their body weight or something like that. Or even they, they just finished a mass phase and they just need some time, literal, literal time at that body weight to allow their set points to come back up a little bit or vice versa. So sometimes like you, uh, we, we can, we can look at it from the training only side, but usually we look at it from the holistic side and we say, so you might only need two or three weeks, but what are you going to do for the rest of the, you know, the diet that you still are running at that time? So that's kind of the problem. So that's why we usually kind of recommend the resensitization phase just because it fits nicely into a kind of blocky type schedule. So, but if you're advanced, you could absolutely not do that so long as you met the criteria for whatever diet stuff that you're doing at the same time. Yeah, 100%. Uh, excellent, James. That's actually the, the only other reason why we would extend one of those phases. Um, 4A, would a single meso of strength focus even contribute to any significant strength gain? <laughs> I was thinking of uh, using a month, my month of resensitization between masking and cutting to just get my strength up a little. Because so I think our formal stance is here, we can't actually promise you any strength gains. Uh, it's possible, but it's also possible that you won't get any strength gains, that it'll just be all gear shifting. At the end of the day, you won't really get much out of it. So... And it depends too, like how you want to define the strength gain, because let's say you had been doing dumbbell bench press for your hypertrophy mesocycle, and then you switch to strength and you switch to barbell. Well, you're actually just going to be making improvements for the first like two or three weeks just from switching to barbell, right? How much of that is true, like strength improvement and the barbell lift versus just the novelty effect of kind of refining that technique in the acute sense? There's a little bit of both going on. So it's very difficult to determine. So again, that pays lip service to what Mike said, like it's probably worth doing it for two months because you're going to get the initial recalibration of either using a heavier load or using a new movement or some combination of both. So you got to recalibrate a little bit and then see where your strength goes after that, because it's, it's just, it's a, it's noise. It's just, it's a, it's a noisy mess at that point to really figure out. And actually one of the things that I, I finished the individualization chapter and one of the markers of progress that Mike mentioned that I thought was really good was, um, has your rep strength increased for a new exercise at the beginning of a block or beginning of a mesocycle? That's a guaranteed way to know. Like if you haven't done barbell bench in a while and you just put up a number that you have never hit before at like four from fail, you got stronger, homie. And that's yeah. another a good, a good example of that. But more often than not, it's like you're going to be back to a weight that's kind of in your, your wheelhouse and then your performance will kind of creep up, creep up, creep up. And then what happens after two or three weeks, that's how you know if you really got stronger or not. Yeah, so maintenance phase is a real good way of finding out if you got stronger and probably not much, much more than that. And, and so yeah. Ways. All right. Aiden says, hi, Mike and James. I have a question about a client. I have their weekly, I have in their weekly schedule. They do mostly different shifts slash shift lengths most weeks. So he has some weeks where he can compete, complete all six days within a week, but then some weeks it takes him a week and a half to complete the six oh. days due to his 12 hour shifts, making him not want to train after them. Not want to train. Fuck does that mean brother? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> he's eager to do six days so he can get all the volume he can in the week. So doing less days isn't an option for him. Will this impact anything in terms of muscle building or is it something that we just have to make do with uh, can't complete all six days? So my question back to you, I guess, if I can't answer it, is what does he do on the weeks after he misses some days? Does he try to rush and make them up? Does he do eight days a week or is it just he keeps getting pushed back? If it keeps, if it, both of those are fine, I think if he keeps, if he does an eight session week, but the week before is four sessions, so long as it's paired to his ability to recover, I think it's fine. And even if he pushes the weeks, you know, he has a six day base and then he pushes it and pushes it, pushes it. So it, like a four week mezzo really takes him six weeks to finish. Um, I think that's also fine. Um, that basically when he's able to, he does six days and when he's not, he does less. That's a pretty decent way to all regulate as long as you can keep him sane and not doing anything stupid, like trying to cram too many days when he isn't prepared to do them. I think that's totally fine. You do have some downsides there in uh, the structure of the program, getting elongated for too much and, stuff like that. Um, if he knows in advance, he won't be able to train in the next couple of days. He can do a little bit of functional overreaching on the days before. That'd be a more advanced critique, but I, on, its, on its face, I don't think it's, it's a bad thing. 
um, James. I don't think it's a bad thing either. And this is one of those times where you might use kind of like a, a, a nonlinear approach or like a, I guess, like a non-parametric mesocycle. No, that's right. right. Where um, just you might- a, no, Just session numbers. Yeah. Exactly. You say like you have six training sessions and then you have one mandatory rest day where like after right. day, whatever, you can make up whatever day you want. But let's just say after day six, you have to rest. And then you have maybe two rest days that you can auto-regulate based on your schedule and, and needs, right? So you can either mm-hmm. backload them or front load them depending on the week and depending on the situation. And that's fine. So if effectively you have like a nine day um, micro cycle, which is kind of weird, but it ends up just being easier that way where you can just say like, okay, you just have to go through one through six. You just repeat the cycle wherever they end up on whatever days they are. That's it. You're not going to have the best in terms of um, <clears throat> circadian rhythms in terms of like doing the same things at the same times per week. So that's out. So that's a, a definitely a downside, but jobs a bigger priority than training at this point, right? So it's just an unfortunate situation, part of life. And we just say, okay, you know what? You got your six days. It's not a, it's not a seven day microcycle. Maybe it ends up being a 10 day microcycle or something like that, but that's fine. Totally not a big deal. You can do pretty well doing that as well. Yeah. The, James, can you speak to people that say they want, that say they're going to get all the days done? Like at what point would you cut off a client who decided I'm going to do the six day non-parametric program and you look at their average mesa cycle and it's an average of three days per week per microcycle. <laughs> like at what point do you say, look, I hate to break it to you, but you're failing. <laughs> yeah. We don't need to do this. You can just do three days. I think if we're talking hypertrophy training and in the hypertrophy training with the context of like, I am trying to gain muscle or maintain muscle like massing or cutting, right? Four to six is kind of that sweet spot. Like if you're, if you're doing less than four to six, you're mostly doing maintenance training at that point, right? So if you get down to like three or less on average, at that point, it might be a good time to just reassess your goals and just say like, what am I really trying to do here? Let's just do maintenance for a while until my job situation is more calm or maybe I can look into changing it up or something like that. But there's just kind of, you have to have that reassessment of realistic expectations. Like if you have to take three training days in a row and then five off entirely and then one training day and then another three days off and then four days of training. It's just, it's too messy at that point. I don't know. So I, for me, I think if you can't get like an average of at least four days per week consistently, uh, it's time to reevaluate the goals. Yeah. Cause a lot of people think they can do that shit. Like I'm going to do six days. And like, I know you think you're going to do six days, but you have three weeks where you've done two days. We really need a six day rotator. Maybe we'll do a three day rotator. And if you can't yeah. get through all of those. Like, and three days is like great for maintaining your muscle, maintaining your cardiovascular fitness and general health outcomes, stuff like that. But it's unrealistic to think that you're going to be like a super jacked guy or girl training on average three days per week. Right. So at that point, it's more of an issue of like expectations and in reality, like what, what do we really think is going to happen here? Not much. So. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, James, I just wrote down your idea for non-parametric training, by the way. Oh, <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm full of good shit today, apparently. Motherfucker. <laughs> you know where that's gone. Uh, all right. A man who only uses his free time for one thing, breaking the most intense cybernetic defense systems of the world, <laughs> Daniel Hacker. And hanging out with Ashley Kavanaugh. That's right. It's very similar two things someone asked about this a long time ago and i don't remember your answer so here i am again <laughs> what to do if someone has an average to fit build genetically oh i see average to fit build. Uh, to fit build genetically has stretchy skin will it subside when someone gets really really lean or is it one of these things that someone just has to live with i don't know if i've ever met anyone i've met people who were like over fat and lost weight and they had extra skin yeah um, I don't know if I've ever met someone where I was just like, damn, dude, you got stretchy skin. Like, yeah, I've always been like this, bro. Stretch Armstrong yeah. over here. You know, I, uh, Daniel, I don't know. Uh, James, I guess. Would, um, I'm not well, sure. I, if let's assume it's the former fat person and it says, will it subside when someone gets really lean? No. Uh, you just have to live with it. It does, it does uh, decrease a little bit over time, but not as much as you would like to think. And if it's a lot of excess skin, surgery definitely fixes that. Yeah. And even like even getting more muscular, like if somebody gets real thin and then you actually get them to beef up over time, you can't put on that much muscle to actually fill out all of the skin. That's a common misconception too. People are like, oh, I'll just get jacked and I'll look normal. It's like, ah, yeah. you'll well, look better. You'll yeah. look better, but you won't it look It sort of depends on where the, the skin is. Like if, 
if it's uh, on your quads and your glutes, you may be able to get muscular enough to really fill it out. If, but mostly that kind of skin is on your abs, and there's no way to increase your midsection that much. Uh, <laughs> Which is going to look awful if you did, right? Like, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> like you have – there's a fat guy. He pulls off the shirt. And like, no, I'm not fat anymore. That See? Like, gong, 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 gong. Like, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Next uh, question. You've said time and time again the direct abs. <laughs> there we go. Isn't there it needed. is. <laughs> Unless one has deemed their abs uh, need to appear thicker, a la men's physique or men's heavyweight bodybuilding. You've said the compound spine stabilizing work is enough to keep the abs nice and tight, potentially even hypertrophy them slightly. Well, not potentially, for sure, hypertrophy them slightly. Being that this is all the subsequent case, why is it that one starts doing direct ab training, their abs get so beyond rocked? Because direct ab training trains you way harder than anything you've trained with before and will hypertrophy you way more than anything you have before. But what we're saying is that hypertrophy is just unnecessary for most things until and unless you need them. And the, 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 the abdominal training you get from the normal hypertrophy training stuff is not exclusively, but largely isometric. So, I mean, really you're getting a whole different like type of loaded contraction yeah. at that point. It's a completely novel stimulus. You've been yeah. mostly doing isometrics. Now you're adding loaded concentric eccentric. It's just, your body's like, Holy fuck. What yeah. is this? It's not just a new exercise. It's a new type of exercise, which is real, real big deal. I work hard for my results and I need my diet dialed in. The RP Diet app tells me what to eat to keep me on track and offers suggestions for changes based on my responses, giving me the freedom to choose my path. A personal digital diet coach for less than $15 a month? Yeah, that works. All right. Uh, for physique, do you find it's really difficult to set mesocycle and macrocycle goals? I find that having body weight goals depending on one of massing your cut is legitimate but besides that any other type of goals set me sets me and i'm projecting for others on the wrong path if you set performance goals like i want to see another x for the set by rep scheme you may run the risk of prioritizing a movement and its progression at the expense of the program because that's the only goal you set if you set body goals like i want to add a half inch to my quads or arms in another six months but yeah I, I don't like those goals uh don't hold me on this it's super hard to track because of body weight body fat fluctuations up or down Spending on the macrocycle goal, in addition, I have found that if I focus on circumference of muscle measurement, I become so obsessed with measuring that I become even more neurotic than I already am, which is <laughs> no fun for anyone, especially myself. In a barbell sport, uh, it's so easy to set measurable goals. Did you lift more weight or get more reps? In a speed sport, it's easy. Did you run that mile or 100 meter faster than the last time? In a combat sport, it's easier. Did you make people tap or knock them out when you couldn't six months ago? How do you go about setting goals for physique? So I, I will actually have uh, some insight here. There are three kind of goals. There are process goals, performance goals, and outcome goals. Process goal is I am setting this goal to show up to the gym six times per week and train as hard as I need to that science tells me to train to get jacked. A performance goal is am I hitting the kind of numbers and RIRs and short-term strength improvements that are going to get me where I need to go in the long term? And an outcome goal is like, actually getting six inch whatever arms for the first time six inch arms six inch um, arms <laughs> some people start out with five inch arms james don't be a dick right <laughs> children um ch that's right <laughs> i'm gonna get six inch arms but you just never grow and you never get them. fuck um so basically um that's that and an interesting insight from sports psychology which is funny because one of our youtube questions today is by um uh, Milo Wolf, and he says that uh, he wants to see more sports psych questions on here, and we do have an answer for his question today. Mm -hmm. Sports psychology revel revelation is this. It is very important to set and stick to process goals. It is somewhat important to set and stick to performance goals. It is not very important to set and stick to outcome goals, because if your process and your performance is on track, the outcome's probably going to happen. If they're not on track, the outcome's probably not going to happen. For example, how many fighters set the goal of w knocking out the guy at your next, uh, you know, tap them out or knock them out at your next competition? All these fucks set the same goal. How many of them do it? Just one, really. 
right? Or one per fight. So, well, what was wrong? Well, let's put genetics aside. What kind of process goals do they have? Like one of the guys showed up to the gym three days a week. The other guy, six days a week. Who do you think is going to win on average, right? What about performance goal? One of the guys is passing people's guards like crazy and landing punches on his advanced partners like crazy. And one of them's not. Like, clearly, I don't care what you think is going to happen in the fight. I'm betting on the guy that's doing better in training, right, that has the higher performance. So the, in a roundabout way, what I'm saying is your goals in training for hypertrophy, hypertrophy especially, should be, I am going to fucking execute the plan like you wouldn't believe. Your performance goals should be as simple as, I'm going to make sure I hit the RIRs that I want to hit and my reps don't fall slash keep going until and unless I'm not able to do that. And then I deload. And then your outcome goals or another performance goal is body weight, right? Which is really easy uh, to make sure you hit. If you are hitting your training like you're goddamn supposed to, if you're hitting your body weight markers like you're supposed to, what do you think is going to happen to your outcome? Well, here's the reality. You have no idea if you're going to hit your outcome. Like, let me get really ranty here. When people say, I want to add half an inch to my quads or arms, what can you possibly do to add a half an inch to your quads and arms in six months? Well, the answer is every, you can do everything optimally. Just fucking do that. Why would you not do that anyway? <laughs> right? And if you want to add, you know, and these goals are important in, in, in a very hazy way. Like I want to make my quads bigger. Well, then you should probably structure your program, by the way, also a process goal now in such a way that maximizes quad training and possibly minimizes other forms of training to give you some room in your weekly systemic recovery ability. It all comes down to those process goals. Set the process goals right. Make sure the performance goals have you on track, doing your best. And then the outcome goals are really just hopes. And they can be cool things to think of. But saying in six months, like, what if you had a half an inch to your quads in seven months and not six? Did you fail? No. Like, some, you don't have a choice in a lot of these. You do fucking have a choice in if you show up to the gym six times a week or not. You have 100 fucking percent choice in that or 99.9 short of a fucking asteroid destroying the gym. You don't have a choice in getting half an inch on your quads or arms for six months. That is largely out of your control uh, even after you set all of your shit straight because you don't know what genetics you have. You don't know how close to your mind nuclear domain you have. James? Yeah, those are all excellent points. And the one thing that I think is really funny in, in, in terms of outcome goals in sports, and this is maybe less pertinent to hypertrophy, so I apologize for tangenting a little bit, but it's just in sports in general, it's hard to have really strong outcome goals because so much of what you do is outside of your control. Like quite literally, like an asteroid, like you said, could hit the field that you're supposed to play on that night. And you're like, well, fuck, I can't, I literally can't have this outcome goal because an asteroid which dropped. Or sometimes it depends on like what your opponent does. You know, like the old saying, like, uh, when the stars align, like everything yeah. just fell into place. Well, like that's a huge, or that's a, that's a massively small probability that those things will happen in many cases because you're doing your best, but the other person that you're competing against is often doing their best too. And let's say that your best is under dry conditions and it happened to rain that day or something. You know, yeah. it's just, just one of those weird things where like uh, it's hard to put outcome goals, like to, to take them overly seriously because you are a slave to the world in some ways and some things you just can't, you just can't, you have no control over. So yeah. the best use of your time is using the goals that you uh, are, are focusing on the goals that you can actually influence with your own efforts, right? That's kind yeah. of the idea. Make process goals, enjoy the process, keep your performance goals realistic and make sure that they're keeping you on track so that the process is not malfunctioning, you don't know about it. And then your outcome goals just have these sort of hazy desires in your head. Um, and some outcome goals are easier said, easier done, than others. For example, striated glutes at my next show. You can pick which show you do and you can diet hard enough to get striated glutes. Almost as a rule, most people can do it if they just diet hard enough. That's a fine outcome goal, but you're going to have to be, you know, if you pick a, a goal of I want striated glutes at this coming show, man, you know, that's already not clear. Like you, you might be dieting as hard as possible and still not get them, right? Because you just ran out of time or something like that, or you were holding a lot of water, so on and so forth. So you can have outcome goals in bodybuilding, but you know, especially for muscle gain goals, gee, you know, it's really a lot of it's out of your hands. And, and James, I just thought of another way of uh, another interesting thing that happens in sports or outcome goals. A lot of teams will lose to a team last year at the tournament and say, we're going to beat, you know, we're going to beat state at the tournament this year. And then state gets bumped out in the first round at the other end of the bracket or in the second round. And yeah. You still, you would still win the tournament, but it's against a school you don't even hate. You never even got to play state that year. Like, God damn it. This yeah. feels like not bittersweet, but kind of saccharine, you know, you're like, 
Mm-hmm. Totally. Or like uh, Jared Feather could be like, you know what? I went to the Olympia this year. I saw those guys. I bet you I could fucking, I could take it. I bet I could get up there and be Mr. Olympia. And then Phil Heath shows up and you're like, fuck. Yeah. Fuck. Dude, that what? happens all the time in bodybuilding. I love it. I love it. it. They say like, this guy is the next best thing. I'm like, you dumb assholes don't understand that there's some kind of person in a garage right now who doesn't know good from bad. He doesn't know wrong from right. He doesn't know anything about bodybuilding, but he is already 290 and lean because he's too goddamn stupid <laughs> to be anything else. And he's going to show up and fuck everyone in the ass. Right. And like, uh, actually an interesting example of that is like, you know, in the Mr. Olympia, it, the Lee Haney era was drawing to a close and people thought who was going to be the guy to take it. It was only, I think, a year or two before Haney retired that Dorian Yates showed up and people were like, holy fuck. What people were talking about all kinds of guys before he showed up. It, people, some of those guys probably thought, I'm going to be the one to take it. Dude, what about Ronnie fucking Coleman? Ronnie came in a fucking nowhere. <laughs> like, the year before Dorian retired. Like, 1997 was a, a, a tough year for Ronnie Coleman. And then 98, he won the fucking Olympia. Like, you could have thought all sorts of things. So when people say, like, I want to win the Olympia... I think that's nice if it organizes, if it helps you to set your process goals and performance goals, I think it's great. But I think people value outcome goals way too goddamn much. I honestly think, James, let me know if you think about this. It allows them to sort of sublimate their anxiety about their goals. Like if they tell enough people they want to be Mr. Olympia, it almost makes them feel like they're sort of halfway there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I hate people who talk about their goals too goddamn much. It's kind of like a, a, a weak ass form of virtue signaling. Like I have aspirations yeah. for this, which by default makes me that person, right? Like, that's nice. Like, yeah. Nobody gives a shit. You, anyone can say they want to win the Mr. Olympia. And I literally mean anyone can fucking say that. Totally. Totally. So yeah, I, I'm with you on all those points. It, the, it, it, it is, I think it's still worthwhile to consider outcomes, but you know, for me, yeah. it's like, it's like the, the icing on the cake. Like, Oh yeah, I got that thing that I, I wanted, but what was more important was like how I got there. Yeah. So like, I think outcome goals are kind of like, uh, if you're hiking the, the, the um, peak of a mountain, like you see it, you sort of, it, you know which way generally to go and it keeps you full of hope. Like, Ooh, when I get there, it's going to be great. Can you say to the minute when you're going to get there? No. What is fundamentally like, if you're like, all right, got to get to the mountain, got to get to the mountain. What do I do? Process, put one foot in front of the other, put your crampons on, put your fucking snow gear on, take it off, go to sleep, get adjusted to the altitude. There's so many processes and there's so many performance goals. Like, okay, we got to get four miles every day or we don't make it to the summit by the time the weather turns bad like those are the relevant things and i'll tell you this if someone remotely knows to go up and has a really awesome performance and a really really great process they're going to beat you to the summit i don't give a fuck how much you want to summit doesn't matter because the doing is how you get that shit to happen you know as a an avid hiker there's nothing that pisses me off more than like when i spend the night before a hike like programming my gps with the exact track and route and i like make notes to myself of like turn here look for these landmarks and i have my super expensive like gear my pack my hat my sunblock everything on my water blah, blah, blah. i do the hike i get to the top i'm like woo i prepped i made it and then some like dildo guy in like flip-flops and like yep. you know like no shirt on just like happens to just like walk up like oh hey bro you made it up too i was like son of a bitch this guy it. made it fuck yeah way over prepared fuck that all right next question from mr daniel hacker how long do you think it's fair to say if one tries a new physical activity they can confidently say it's not for them say someone is reasonably fit and wants to try a new sport they're seemingly very passionate about the activity and they really want to learn we know that there are activities that some people uh, are just not made to do slash shouldn't do. And personally, I hate when I see people trying so hard in an activity that genetically they just aren't well suited for. Well, it, it depends on if, what they're going for. If they're going to be for being good, yes. If they like it, who cares? Um, would you say if one does said activity two times a week for a year with an emphasis on fun and technique, they don't make noticeable improvements, oh Jesus, or really get enjoyment out of it, uh, it's very educated for them to say, they tried their best, but it's not for them. Doing something once a week for a month or two, like many do when they want to try something out, doesn't really give them much more time to definitely say they gave it a real good college try. I think it would depend on the activity. Um, I'll tell you this. My, the toughest thing I've ever done as far as like shit that took me a long time to like was jujitsu. Um, Melissa Davis, Dr. Melissa Davis, Dr. Wife. Dr. Wife. Right, of James Hoffman. As, as Yasha calls her, apparently. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, so she told me as soon as I started jujitsu, she goes, just, just shut your eyes for the year. Just shut up and do it for a year. You're going to hate it. And then you're going to love it at the end of the year. 
Um, I, that advice kept me from quitting jujitsu for sure. I owe Mel all of my jujitsu for that reason. It actually took me just six months, uh, probably because I had a wrestling background and I was really strong. So I started being able to make sense of shit and beat people faster. Beating people is really fun. Making sense of jujitsu is probably even more fun. So before that, it's just you get beat all the time and nothing makes any goddamn sense. Um, what I will say is once you've got the basic flow of the activity, like you're going in, like so for jujitsu, let's say for tennis, for tennis, different because jujitsu is very specific to a sport, tennis. You know how to hit a good forehand. You know how to hit a good backhand. You're playing against people all the time. You're running up and down the court. You're just generally good positions. Um, you're feeling your own swag and you're hitting really well back and forth. You've got a good rally going and you get to beat some people that are not as good as you ever now and again. If you don't like it at that point, you're never going to fucking like tennis. Uh, maybe not never, but it could. you're doing what you're going to be doing anyway. It's just, you sort of win a little bit more and lose a little less as the competition gets harder. You don't even do that. Right. You just become better at doing those things. And if you don't like doing those things, when you're already relatively competent, you're not you're just probably not going to like them. Like I can totally understand the awkward phase um, being sucky, but like once you're well into something and you're doing it and, and the, now the gains are going to be more linear than exponential, it's just not going to change quality wise. If you don't already like it, at least somewhat chances of you growing into it, I would never say you're zero, but this sure is hell pretty low, James. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Actually, I was going to say uh, it's one thing to suck at something, right? It's another thing to suck and not enjoy it at the same time. Like if you're not enjoying it, cut it off at six months. I mean, at that point, like it, you have to be able to differentiate those things. Like Mike, Mike said, like, and this is, I, I wrestled as well. Like the first year of wrestling is the same thing that Mike described. Like you just get your ass beat the whole time. And you're like this. Sucks. And you suck at everything. And you suck. But like at some point you get a win in practice. Like you, you pin somebody and you're like, Oh, okay, this is great. Right. So I think like um, there's a, there's a difference between like understanding that you're bad. Right. And there's a great adventure time quote. Uh, Jake says, suck it at something's the first step at becoming really good at something. Um, uh, I love that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's one thing to recognize that you're bad at something, but you're still having fun doing it. Even if you're bad, like obviously doing good is more fun, but if you're having fun, keep doing it. If you're, if you suck and you're not having fun, why are you doing it? Why it's, you, you yeah. can't even justify it by saying I'm having fun. Like just on to the next one, do something else. Yeah. And the third component of that is, are you generally within what people can describe as some kind of competence? Like if you're doing jujitsu and people see you roll after three or four months and they can't tell what you're doing, if you're having a spastic contraction or if you're actually doing jujitsu, maybe you hate jujitsu, but you're not actually doing it yet. But like if you're a blue belt, people come in that are white belts, you sweep them, you submit them and you take their back and all the stuff, you're doing all the basic moves and you're feeling your, like there's a, you know, James, I'm talking about feeling your swag in sport. You're like, I'm doing the sport yeah. as it's supposed to be done. Often and, called a, the flow state, right? Like yeah, the flow state. state. Exactly. If you're in the flow state and both externally confirmed by coaches and internally felt by you and you still don't like it, man, you know. Dude, I, I, when Mel and I were getting ready for our wedding, we had to take dance lessons. And I, I, could, that. I could get into the flow state for dancing, but I fucking hated it. You know, yeah. I, I could will myself into it and do a good yeah. job but I fucking hated it. And I have never, I've not taken another dance lesson since. Fuck that. Never going to dance again. Exactly. Or, I think dancing stupid. How many times do you think it took me to uh, golfing to figure out I didn't like it? <laughs> once. One. Yeah. I went golfing Fuck once, that. never went again. Right. It sucked. I was like, where's the fat guys I'm supposed to push. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I hit people? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, ah, like, like, oh, there's no fat guys. Oh man. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So if you get into a flow state and you're not losing 100% of the time and you still don't like the sport, like, no uh, shame. One, I think, no shame. Yeah. Like, so, so here's an easy one for kickboxing. If within several weeks of getting relatively decent kicks and punches technique wise, where you to totally feel like you're on strings, if you're not getting some kind of enjoyment out of a real like zip, like suck pat hit, or just one of those just connections with a bag with your kick. If that doesn't bring you some kind of sick joy, you're not going to like kickboxing because it's just more of the same. Eventually it's other people's faces that you're doing that too. Yeah. And it hurts worse than the bag, by the way, for sure. It hurts worse. <laughs> and also like, yeah, even beating people, you can beat people in all kinds of stuff, you know, like beating people while you hate the activity is not going to make you want to like, like the activity, you know, like, so if you don't like the fundamentals of the sport, once you get your swag going, fuck man, I got, you know, it's probably, yeah. I for you to not do it. Yeah. 
All right. Well, I think that's it for the, uh, uh, oh, sorry. The pre-listed questions. My bad on that burp that just came out. Um, we got uh, YouTube questions this week. Yep, we do. Should Let's I do it. my screen share? Yes, please. Okay. I do the screen and I do the share. I can has. You show Bob's. I am have Bob's. Do you see it? Yeah. Okie doke. Let's get to the questions. We'll do a couple here today. <laughs> Betty Powerlifting's back. <laughs> this cat reminds me of Marimi's cat, which will never <laughs> shut up. Hey. You, that cat was going getting after it that last that last time it was like, meow, meow. The cat is yeah, very, you- yeah. Just, <laughs> he wants attention. Um, all right. So, elation weeks while hunting MRV, will mind muscle connection go down over the weeks? Is it bad or okay? I can always, uh, I always feel I can squeeze the muscle the hardest if I'm deloaded and fully recovered. Yeah. So, like as fatigue accumulates, uh, technique and mind muscle connection will will deteriorate to some extent. During accumulation, you should be able to have a slight increase, at least for the first half of it in mind-muscle connection, because your technique and the exercises and practice of getting the mind-muscle connection should be going up. You can obviate that by just chasing reps and forgetting about it altogether, in which case it'll just deteriorate from day one, which you shouldn't do. So there's that. But generally speaking, it should go up through some of the accumulation phase, or at least not go down. But when your fatigue starts to really get high in the last, I would say, what, James, two weeks? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can expect it to not be so great. And then you kind of know that the shit is coming and you're going to have to deload soon. That's one of those, I guess, we never formally published this, but it, just very colloquially, observationally, uh, a reduction in mind-muscle connection is kind of a leading indicator of systemic fatigue. Like, you're fine. If your performance is still fine, you're good. But it's not going to last for a long time if it's getting to that. Yeah. So like during overreaching periods, it's a very common symptom. And then actually when you're, um, if you've been using like the same movements and you're at the end of a block, like, so you've been doing the same kind of movements for like three mesos, sometimes your MEV gets up to like close to your MRV levels, right? Which is, you know, either at the time or past the time that you want to swap that exercise. But that's another instance where that can happen. So it's like planned overreaching and like staleness essentially. Yeah. That, that yeah. If that happens, well, like if your best uh, my muscle connection is only in the first week of accumulation for two mesos in a row. It's probably time to ditch that exercise and switch. Yeah, totally. All right. A really good question by Milo Wolf, uh, who is, whose Instagram memes I share all the time. Uh, and who is the gentleman actually that does the uh, transcription of our, uh, he does the uh, timestamps for the podcast. Oh, nice. He says, how would you use positive illusions regarding sports psychology with your athletes to facilitate performance outcomes? Would you encourage a narcissistic predisposition? Loving the Q&As, but I find, often find the sports psychology component a little overlooked by the question askers. Well, you can't fault the question askers for that. You've got to ask these questions, you dumb asshole, Milo, you piece of shit. And, and to just be very blunt and fair, like Mike and I are not sports psychologists. We have a lot of experience in sports. Uh, and we have probably some, some things worth mentioning, but like, we're definitely not psychologists. Yeah. So any, any psychology advice would be prefaced by that saying, Hey, yeah. you know, there's probably better people to ask, but we'll give you what we think. Yeah. So, uh, if I understand your question correctly, what you're basically saying is how do you ever tell your athletes that some narcissistic predisposition is like the thinking that athletes have of like, I'm fucking invincible. I'm a fucking champion. I'm fucking warrior. Fuck all these other clowns. Um, I think that that can tend to help in, a, in some uh, situations, um, but it's called positive illusions for a reason, and I don't like for illusory things to be the reality often, because if you delude yourself enough, you can really lose track of reality, and then you can lose track of good training, where you stand performance-wise, you can misestimate how good you are. So someone says, hey, are you ready to turn pro from being amateur in MMA? And you're like, fuck yeah. And your coach is like, not even close, right? <laughs> um, taking fights with certain people, so on and so forth. Um, trying certain things in training that might uh, backfire. Um, so what I like to do is I like to save my own personal, what you would call narcissistic predisposition, uh, for the day of competition, actually, and really just pretty 
just at various spontaneous times during competition. Um, and I'm very aware that this is not reality most of that time. Um, I just do it for that enhancement effect. So for example, when I enter like a, a jujitsu gym, uh, not a jujitsu gym, sorry, a, a, a gymnasium or a, a hall in which jujitsu competition is occurring and I'm in the competition, I'll, I'll generally tend to look at other guys my size and be like, look at this fucking piece of shit. Fuck this fat cocksucker. I'm going to fucking molest this person. I'm going to exert God's fucking will on this person. And I'm a fucking unstoppable machine. And they should have never put me in the same room with any of these people. They're in mortal fucking danger. And then I'll go back to just being a cool, regular, normal person and saying hi to everyone and shaking their hands. And then right before the match starts, like when the guy's putting on his, uh, James, remember he put on that shit on wrestling, the, uh, the little the ankle tape, band. Yeah. The ankle band. So you just, sometimes you put that on, sometimes you put on a different color belt or sometimes they just tell you what you are. Like during that time, when we both come up to the desk, like I'm just like fucking asshole decided he's still going to sign up for this division. He didn't just run. I'm going to fucking like I'm untouchable. Like that's what I'll think. And I'll just full of hatred and it super, super helps. But the thing is like, if, if I thought that all the time throughout the day, throughout weeks of preparation, Jesus Christ, that'd be a goddamn mess. And it's a shitload of psych psychic energy you're spilling away that you just probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, uh, you know, if I, if, and when I coach athletes, um, I'll usually use, uh, you know, as this is for positive illusions, right? I would say to them, like, you're a fucking champion. You're a fucking champion. You're fucking strong. You're the shit. Let's go. And, it, you know, I need for them to agree with me. It's like, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? How are you going to do that? I'm going to fucking, I'm going to fucking win. I'm going to fucking win. Like, yeah, sweet. Let's go. Let's fucking murder people. And then as soon as they're done, you cool that down. Like, hey, good job. Everything is nice. Everything's calm. And then we ramp them up real close to competition. You don't want to like be on the car ride four hours to jujitsu and be like, fucking boy, you're the fucking man. Let's break glass like in the car with our faces because that just pisses away a lot of energy. So chill, 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 spike, and then chill back down. James? Yeah. So um, there's actually a really good book I'm going to recommend. It's called Conscious Coaching by Brett Bartholomew. Uh, and it is a really great resource. I've heard nothing but really great things about that book. Yeah. It's a really great book. It's, it helps you identify like uh, personality traits within your athletes and then uh, how to adopt coaching strategies that can facilitate the best outcomes for them. So I think what's worth noting here is like positive illusions might not be for everyone, nor might not be uh, applicable in all situations. It might be one of those things you have to kind of make a good assessment of your individual with. I think, um, I think positive illusions can be useful to combat what is, I think it's actually called the Tiger Woods effect, which is basically um, people will tend to crumble in the presence of someone they think is like untouchably great. And this yeah. is like a well-documented effect in, a, in the front and back in a variety of different ways they've measured it where like if Tiger Woods shows up, um, it's a good chance he's just going to win just because he, other people will be like in awe of his presence, right? So that might be a good way of kind of uh, prepping someone to prepare for those kind of effects where you have some like godlike person who shows up to compete and you want to reaffirm that that person is just a human being just like the other person is. Um, possibly a good situation there but again i would i would defer to, to someone else because i'm i'd be more uh i'd be i'd be given the wrong advice more often than not would be my guess yeah fuck you know uh i actually have a real good psychological maybe it's a strategy i just fall into this line of thinking when somebody really really good shows up and this it just occurs in jiu-jitsu gyms in general and like in uh competition as well it is it, especially in jiu-jitsu gyms because you get to go against guys that you would never be competing against because you're not even your belt rank or you never qualify for the competitions um a lot of people get really shut down when they're going against someone good it's really sometimes works to think of uh, what you have to lose and what you have to gain you have nothing to lose because you and everyone else and him they or her they think they're going to fucking whoop your ass and if you get your ass beat nobody's ever going to judge you mm -hmm. like that's a guy's a black belt stud but what if you can give him a little more trouble than he thought. What if you can give him trouble, trouble? you got everything to gain. That's fucking awesome. Like, uh, what was that? This really stupid fucking movie, um, which I love, of course. It's stupid as fuck. Uh, the fucking remake with the Medusa and the fucking owl, James, the Titan, uh, Clash Titans? of the Titans. Clash of the Titans? Clash oh of the Titans. Oh, the, my the, God. The oh, my God. So, the, you know, the remake, the, the 2000s one? Yeah. The guy, he asked one of the dudes, the main guy, he's like, why don't you ever smile? He's like, uh, I, you know, the gods killed everyone I loved. Like, I'll smile when I see a god die or some shit. And then as Medusa is getting fucking her head chopped off and this guy's already turning to stone, he smirks. And I was like, Ooh. <laughs> like, I kind of want to be that guy, just fucking real studs when they show up. Like, Jiu -jitsu, I'm like, I'm going to be the guy that you're going to have to really use your A game on and walk away being like, fuck that, man, fuck that guy. Like, I, 
I sure hope not everyone else at this gym is as good as him. You know, like even if you beat me, it's going to be like not your confident, not your best. So I think that's a really cool way to think about guys you're going up that are studs. You're like, what if I, I'm the guy to crack this fucking clown? What if I'm the, I'm the chink in his armor? What if I manage to take a fucking just one ankle pick and there's a couple minutes, there's a couple seconds left and I'm up two to, you know what, what if, right? And then all of a sudden, if you're that guy, that, you know, think about what he feels like. If you're good and he starts grappling with you or t- playing tennis or whatever, and he packs, picks up on the fact that you're fucking good, he's going to be like, Jesus Christ, I have everything to lose. Like, I don't want to be that guy. I would rather be the underdog in many cases, not all, than the guy who's won before. Because when you won before, you clutch that shit like crazy and you're really averse to making a lot of athletic moves because you're like, don't fuck this up, don't fuck this up. Whereas if you don't, you know, if you have nothing to lose, there's nothing to fuck up. Just play your game. Totally. Totally. All right. Lotus Dreams. Wow, that is a, a beautiful, beautiful name on YouTube. Mm-hmm. It, YouTube's m- m- mostly like Dick Liquor 69. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, says, hey, Docs, I got a question regarding the importance of feeling a pump or a lack thereof, uh, a lack thereof with certain exercise. I have always had and still have over multiple years the impression that incline bench of any kind cannot get me a proper pump in the chest unless it's combined with a flat or decline version. Um, on the other hand, even the shittiest exercise selection with a decline, like angle, takes me almost zero effort to achieve an eight out of 10 pump and a hard contraction. I've never stopped using the incline nor slacked, uh, but I myself, but I'm asking myself if my body feeling consistently tells me to drop incline angles to do more flat or decline angles varieties, if that's a good idea, or should I still stick to improve my upper chest by incline work? How much do you value those proxy variables uh, over performance and anatomical programming logic? Um, it depends on where you feel your pump. So like if you feel your pump in the upper chest more with flat presses, rock on. I suspect that if I had to take a guess at what your chest looks like, you probably have a larger lower chest and a pretty small upper chest. If that's the case, then it makes perfect sense why you get a huge pump in the lower chest because it's just more responsive and there's more muscle there and it's probably more fast which than the upper chest. Um, some combination of those. So if that's the case, you continuing to do those lower chest exercises is great for your lower pecs great for maximum overall chest development, but probably not going to get you anywhere you want to go in, in, uh, in the clavicular upper pecs. So I think if you're doing upper pecs, you could do some reverse grip work that's been shown to stimulate the clavicular fibers pretty well uh, and or incline work of some kind. And uh, it might just be that your upper pecs just don't really get a really good pump. You might have to do more sets. Uh, you will get a pump eventually, just has to do more sets. Um, that just might be uh, the tail of the tape there. So uh, how much do we value the proxy variables over performance? Well, you you know you can improve your incline benching performance by just getting bigger triceps and just have nothing to show for in your upper pecs. So performance can only go so far. Um, so I think you know how big are your upper pecs is mostly of how do you perform on the incline movements, specifically like incline flies, and how do you know how you're performing on them if you're not even doing them? So I would say that if you want bigger upper pecs, probably doing that is a good idea, um, and then. If you want bigger overall packs and especially lower packs, then the decline stuff is a super great idea, James. Yeah. So that's actually a really interesting question. So, um, you know, like what do we think about like the pump versus like what he's called anatomical programming logic? So that's a really good question. Uh, I think that like any of the measures that we use as kind of like our ghetto MEV indicators, like as standalone measurements are probably not that great just by themselves, the pump being one of them, right? So the, an example here might be like, could you do, could you modify your technique in the incline bench to get a massive mind muscle connection and see significant performance increases week to week? while still not getting a pump? Yeah, it's feasible. It's just less likely, right? But it can happen. So usually like you want to see all those things kind of fall in line where you say like, I got a pump. I have a good mind muscle connection. I can feel like the stretch and the tension throughout the muscle I'm trying to train. And my performance generally is improving or is at least stable if I've already kind of figured out my volume landmark stuff. Um, That would be ideal. So I'd say uh, weighing the pump over the other factors like uh, feeling the tension, feeling the mind muscle connection, full range of motion, performance improvements. I would not weigh one of those over three or four others. That would be my opinion. Uh, ideally, you would want to find exercises that hit all of them really nicely. And yeah. I think with the, um, with the incline, and Mike, feel free to chime in here. I think when people don't do the incline well, it's because they do powerlifting incline where they tuck their elbows down like this, right? 
where in reality you should be coming out to the side, right? Yeah. And really getting out wide like this. And this is one of those like quick fix, guaranteed. Do it tonight. Like just do, do a warm up set. Instead of tucking your elbows down and touching, right? Go all the way out to the side as far as you can, or like a wide grip style, and let your arms come out 180 degrees. And you'll feel like a massive pump in your your chest. It'll you might have to f play with the grip width and stuff like that, but it's usually more of a technique issue, like an individualizing the technique to get the most SFR out of the exercise. So yeah. that would be my take on that. I think pump's important, but I wouldn't out I wouldn't like throw an exercise out just because you didn't get a pump if you were getting positive responses on other markers as well. So usually that would mean like how do I get the pump in there? I modify my technique. Something like sure. that. Sure. Yeah. All right. Fusion says, I finally reached Martin Burkhan's advanced strength standards using his RPT program. My body composition has changed significantly from the start. However, I still don't look like I lift when fully clothed. I look athletic <laughs> and lean. Do, neither does Martin. I'm just kidding. Uh, since he started using drugs, he looks like he lifts, I guess. Um, do I have unrealistic expectations? What should I do? Maybe I should do higher volumes. How would I implement this? I feel disappointed because after reading Martin's Fuck Around Itis article, which is a very good article, actually, uh, and dedicating years to it, uh, I thought his method was the best way to train. Uh, well, careful with dogma, um, but I think you're on to something. Now, I'm wondering if it's higher volume, uh, 10 to 15 sets per week. Mike, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry to do this. Be cautious before opening those, those links. I don't, you know, just... Oh, I'm not clicking on shit. Are you okay. fucking kidding me, bro? Well, I don't click on fucking YouTube. Okay, we're on the same. We're on this. I was just like, I mean, I'm sure these people are genuine, but at the same time, I don't want something inappropriate. Dude, yeah, thanks for reminding me. There's no fucking way I'm clicking on that shit. Um, I've always been told that Lean Gains approach isn't the best for size. Dude, if this was a bot algorithm, that would be an impressive algorithm. <laughs> for <laughs> sure. I, oddly specific bot. Um, I've always I just been don't told, like to be like a troll, like, oh, here's like a dick pit, you know. For like, sure, Nazi propaganda. Yeah. Um, I've always been told that Lean Gains approach is the best for size due to its low volume. Isn't the best for size. Okay. Isn't the best for size due to its low volume. But I trust the process. My physique goal is something like blah, please give me advice. Thank you. So it doesn't matter what your physique goal is at all because you just want to be bigger. This is pretty simple, right? Um, uh, Martin Burkhan's approach is low volume, which is a good way to have beginner gains and a great way to get stronger, which is why you reached his advanced strength standards and not size standards. And if you raised your training volume, most people would experience a significant increase in hypertrophy over time. That's absolutely correct. Uh, there's no surprise about this whatsoever. The entire time I read it, I was like, that makes every bit of perfect sense. That, um, you know, when some, someone, someone says, hey, I, you know, I got better hypertrophy on a low volume plan than a higher volume plan. I'm always like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder how you define volumes and so on and so forth. And maybe just, you know, have a really low MRV and high or low MEV. But this, this makes perfect sense. So I would say that um, it, how would you go about it? Uh, how would you implement this? Um, if you just want someone else to follow also from Northern Europe, uh, I would just try one of Meadow Henselman's programs. Uh, he's uh, real smart, and he just does come, higher frequency, higher volume. Come to the dark side. Come to the uh, come the to RP. God damn Come it. to the volume landmarks. So like, yeah, come check this out, right? <laughs> yeah, MRV, right. baby. Yeah. So look up some some stuff. Uh, you know, there's plenty of folks doing higher volume stuff, um, and really, you can just do what you were doing with Martin's stuff. Just stop going to failure. Stop two reps, one rep short of failure, and add some more sets and see how you like it. Just don't jump into like, like I think another common misconception is exactly that. I was going to say a lot of people are like volume. Okay. 10 by 10 GVT, right? Like, no, I mean, I mean at some point maybe, but not, not, not going from strength, like a strength program to that. You got to work yeah. your way up to that it's, at some point. It's like a map of European countries and volumes. It's like Martin Burkhans from Sweden. That's low volume. Ooh, German high volume training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, get a you, skip on right over, you literally skip right over Meadow in the Netherlands doing high, uh, like logical high volume. <laughs> You're like, nah, nah, I'm just going to go straight to Germany. Dude. <laughs> Sorry, Meadow. It's the, it's the meme again. It's the, it's the angry lady. It's like GVT. And then there's Meadow is like the little cat guy. Like, <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, last for today. A very interesting question from Pete Dawson. If maintenance volume is so easily achievable, why do people shrink when they get off gear? Wouldn't the new muscle be easy enough to maintain? Very curious about this. So I have a multi-component answer for you, and then James will fill in the blanks. Um, so first of all, uh, there's two types of size you put on with gear. One is um, actual uh, expansion of myofibrils, that is the contractile elements of muscle tissue, and the other is the expansion of the sarcoplasm, which is all the other bullshit, uh, including fluid inside the cell. When you start gear, 
uh, you gain a shitload of sarcoplasm, and the more gear you take, the more sarcoplasm you have. You also put on more Myra fibrils, but the sarcoplasm happens within weeks and days sometimes. So um, you just get really swollen and you look fucking super jacked. So if you kept all of your Myra fibrils as you came off gear, you would still lose, depending on what you're taking, fucking three to, to 30 pounds. But, well, if you're taking slim and growth and a shit and a couple grams of gear, that is, pound, that is dozens of pounds of intracellular water. You're like a fucking water balloon, right? Um, and it's, it makes you give you that round shape that uh, drugged up pro bodybuilders have that you can't really replicate with anything short of the best genetics of all time, right? So you can lose a shitload of size and still lose no actual muscle as far as contractile tissue is concerned. Uh, or uh, as far as myofibrils are concerned. Secondly, a ton of people, when they come off gear, they train basically not at all or train so easy that it doesn't even count as maintenance training. A lot of them just stop training altogether. And a ton of them, when they come off, stop eating as much as they're supposed to. So they just lose weight because gear makes you hungry. And when you're off gear, you don't feel hungry at all. And you're like, what the fuck am I doing? I don't even train. And a lot of guys, when you take a look at a population of people, when they come off of gear, the most notable people that come off gear are bodybuilders at the end of their careers. So of course they're fucking not going to be as big as they were because they barely train. They eat way, way less and all the exercise of water is off. So let's put it the other way. If someone still is going to get back on gear later, if they're still training relatively hard above maintenance volume and consistently is another big thing too. And if they, if you account for all the cellular water, you keep most of the muscle that you gained on gear, probably almost all of it. Some of that muscle just is no longer being appropriately kept up by the anabolic signaling that's no longer there from the gear. Like some of the muscle you just lose because the anabolic drive is so fucking low. Your catabolism goes up like crazy, right? This is slightly different. Maintenance volume is so easily achievable for people of the same gear status. When you switch gear status on or off, it's no longer nearly as easily achievable. So the first part of your question is actually an assumption that it's easily achievable uh, across drug classes, which that's not the case. But if they attend to all those qualities, most, if not all of the muscle loss they're going to see is just exclusively intracellular water, which means that about three weeks after they get back on, they're going to be about as big as they ever were. And what didn't gain muscle that fucking fast, they gained intracellular uh, uh, contents and all of a sudden, boom, they're good. So one of the cool things about this is there's actually a wisdom to, believe it or not, a wisdom to pro bodybuilders that use drugs. A lot of these guys come off and they look like fucking total shit. And you're like, oh my God, this guy lost 50 pounds of muscle. There's no way he's going to come back. And you're like, oh my God, the Olympia is in eight months. And four weeks later, you see videos of him and you're like, what in the ever living fuck? And he's like, yeah, I got back on shit. Fuck you. What did you think was going to happen? Sean Roden did this. Kevin Lebron did this a bunch. Tons of guys do this. Um, there's a fucking Brazilian 212 guy, Eduardo Correa. Eduardo Correa was on Instagram posting pictures. I thought this motherfucker retired forever. He had like a couple surgeries. He had a couple kids. He was gone for like a few years and he looked like, like a muscular, regular dude. And you were like, what the fuck? And then he came back and competed early this year as better than he's ever looked fucking jacked out of his mind, lean as fuck. You're like, how? The muscle was always there. It was just the cellular water. You know, 30 pounds of intracellular water looks exactly like 30 pounds of new muscle. 30 pounds of new muscle is a lot of fucking muscle. 210, you know, and, and imagine the fat loss at the same time. So someone can have, could be 15% body fat at 210 pounds and then 5% body fat at 240 pounds. Those don't look remotely like the same person. So they're not actually losing muscle in many cases. The muscle loss is minimal but it looks like it because of intracellular water and all the other factors I mentioned. But there is some muscle loss if you take a lot of gear versus none, because look, if you take no gear at all, you're not going back to a regular environment. You're going back to an environment with basically no testosterone, shitloads of estrogen, a bunch of other crap. Even really good post-cycle therapy can only attend to some of that stuff. And for a while, you're just not banging on all cylinders and you can't lose muscle. Right away. James? Yeah, that was really good. Um, in addition to those points, like you have to consider that the the drugs are giving you a super maximal like benefit to the volume landmarks that you're operating in, right? So it's like now you are operating in this super maximal range. When you come out, they shift back down, and then the first couple of weeks and maybe even months, like Mike said, you're you're in the shit house. Even if you have good PCT, so you're going to drop all that bloat kind of uh, bloat weight essentially. 
you're not going to lose a ton of myofibrils in that initial period. But once you have to adjust your training back to quasi normal, it's going to slowly actually start affecting you. You just won't be able to train at the volumes and intensities that you used to anymore because you were training at a supra maximal level. So you get kind of a, a three, three punch there where it's like you de bloat, right? Now the conditions that you're in aren't even normal. They're subpar, right? Yeah. Subpar from normal. So you're going to have really shitty training for a little while. Most people get discouraged in that period and they just kind of do fuck all training. And then when they actually get back to normal, they kind of just look like shit, right? And yeah, at that and point, the eating. A lot of guys eating. stop eating, man. And they might actually just start to lose some of their myofibrillar hypertrophy at that point, right? Which is, the start, that's when they really start to look like shit. So it's kind yeah. of like a combination of factors. The actual muscle mass usually doesn't go away for several, several months, but the bloat stuff comes off pretty quick. So that's kind of the, the deal. So it's not so much that like, it's not that maintenance volume isn't, isn't easy to maintain. Uh, it's hard to go from like a super maximal load down to a normal load and maintain the same amount of muscle mass. Yeah. At that point, it's Which not easy. Fun. It's just funny going back to the bodybuilding wisdom. Like you've seen guys say like, man, I saw what's his name at the Arnold, like just at the expo, not at the competition. And this is an Olympia competitor. Like I saw what's his name. And he's looking fucking small, dude. Fuck the guy bigger than that guy. That's like said by guy who's like cruising on two grams of trend at all times. <laughs> and the bodybuilder he was talking about is basically like on 250 test or on nothing for a couple of months. And then oh, right around April, that bodybuilder starts to gas up and then they show up to the Olympia and you're like, oh shit mm -hmm. so before you judge a bodybuilder who uses drugs like oh he's not that big you have no idea where in his cycle or, or even off his cycle he is and you know that's why they have competitions folks because everyone gets in shape at the same time and they can really compare apples to apples mm -hmm. well that was a good one is that the last one i was gonna say that's, that's the a last good one. one good one last to end one on for now. drugs yay Woo! all right let's see uh so next week i'm gonna be in florida on monday so i'll be in florida on tuesday i probably can still do the webinar same time yeah we were on the same time zone so it should be pretty good oh yeah eastern oh, yeah. time that's true we'll be in the same time zone uh you want to just come to florida no i'm just kidding you know yep, i'll see you in florida <laughs> america's butthole uh no that's indiana uh, okay yeah so we'll just plan on the same time uh folks for those of you who struggled with the new rp plus format bear with us. I had somebody work on it for me today. So hopefully you should be able to post questions uh, nice and easy in the form as they usually were. And for those of you joining us on YouTube, thanks for tuning in and keep posting those good questions. We had some really good ones this week. So very nice job. Peace homies. Later.